Right, uh, good evening everybody. Um, I'd like to, to welcome you to this evening's Global Challenge Lecture from the uh, Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences, or ILAS as it's commonly abbreviated to. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Anthony Wrigley. I'm Professor of Ethics in the School of Law, and I've been asked to, to chair this uh, talk this evening for um, someone who is, a, is actually a very old friend of mine. Um, uh, so I was delighted to be asked to do this. Um, tonight's lecture uh, is titled Public Health and the Nanny State. Um, now, before I hand over to our esteemed speaker, um, for those of you who might be new to these events, um, ILAS promotes interdisciplinary education and research, both here at Kiel and uh, beyond. Um, there is more information if you're interested in this and participating, um, uh, and it's available on the ILAS website. Um, and you can see videos of previous Global Challenge lectures as well there. So um, that's uh, an excellent resource if you're interested. Um, so it's our absolute great pleasure to invite uh, Professor Martin Wilkinson to deliver tonight's lecture. Um, Martin is um, Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, uh, where he teaches and writes on political theory and applied ethics. Um, and notably, he's worked on um, the ethics of um, organ transplantation and public health ethics. Um, indeed, his 2011 book on ethics and the acquisition of organs has been immensely useful to me in my own career uh, ever since it was published and continues to be now uh, as I, I work with the advisory group uh, in the NHS in their um, um, organ and blood donation uh, and transplantation advisory group. Um, prior to this, um, Martin was senior lecturer and then associate professor um, at Auckland's um, School of Population Health um, up to 2009. He's also been Chair of New Zealand's Bioethics Council and Deputy Chair of the National Ethics Advisory Committee, and those are both ministerial advisory committees up to 2016. Um, and he's been a member of the Ministry of Health Expert Advisory Groups. Um, he now serves on the Auckland Hospital Clinical Ethics Committee as well. Um, perhaps most importantly though, 13 years ago, he was a visiting fellow to Kiel. Um, and that is where I know Martin from, um, and the pleasure has been mine ever since. Now, Martin will be happy to take some questions at the end of the lecture. Um, for those of you online, um, there's an opportunity to engage to the Q&A portal uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, welcome to everyone joining us online, by the way, um, and please do join in the conversation. We'll endeavour to pose as many questions as time allows at the end of, of the talk, and we will field them from, from both in the room and online. Um, so, without further ado, I will hand over to Martin um, for his talk on public health and the nanny state. Thank you, Martin. Well, kia ora, everybody, and thanks, Anthony, old pal, uh, <laughs> for, that, old, yeah. for that nauseating introduction. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, it is indeed a great pleasure to be back at Kiel. Uh, he's told you everything. Yeah, I've been here. I was here for six months, 13 years ago, and so forth. I should say also, as another kind of secret pleasure, this is the only place that has been sufficiently stylish to have everyone getting pissed at a lecture on the nanny state. There you all are, <laughs> hoofing it down. Um, very good. Someone's probably going to break out a bong in a minute. Um, now, uh, I've, got to, I've got to explain some preliminaries first. So this, you'll be pleased to know, is the only slide with text in it. So it's just it's the, it's the, out, it's the way the talk's going to go. So the first thing I want to explain is what I'm talking about when I use the terms public health and the terms paternalism. By public health, I do not mean a publicly funded healthcare system. I mean collective efforts to improve the health of populations. The sort of stuff that we all know and love from COVID-19 um, although my interest is really in the attempts to control uh, diseases that don't spread so easily from person to person, such as type 2 diabetes and cancers, strokes, heart diseases, and so forth. So that's the public health side of things. Let me now explain paternalism. By paternalism, I mean roughly trying to stop people do things that they want to do because you think they're going to harm themselves 
or trying to make people do things that they don't want to do because you think it's good for them. So the pater, the Latin root, treating like a father. Um, I have been thinking about paternalism with, with kind of mixed results. For over 30 years, I find it's such a fascinating topic about how people can kind of stuff up their own lives. So on the one side of things, some people are just stupid. And these are some of them. So this is, and this probably shows you how old this is, this is from the New Zealand Herald of 2001. Um, what happened was, off the coast of South Australia, a whale died, and there was a feeding frenzy with all these great white sharks, you know, the kinds that you, you remember from Jaws. And these people, they went out on a boat, to, and you can see them trying to pat the great white sharks. But some of them actually got onto the dead whale to try to reach the sharks. Now, I mean, from these, <laughs> you know, these people look like they need some sort of protection against themselves. So that's one kind of thought one might have. You know, it's hard to be uh, completely dogmatic about, well, people are rational and sensible and so on. What about this? On the other hand, there are plenty of occasions where people do things that look like they might be daft, but they might have good reasons for it. So this is a different example. This is taken from a fruit and vegetable shop in Auckland, in New Zealand, earlier, earlier this year when we had the great avocado shortage. Um, and the price of avocados went up to about seven bucks each, which is three pounds fifty-ish. And people were nicking avocados. So you can see that's why, um, yeah, they like the cash, not kept on the premises. Now, if you're trying to understand why people eat unhealthy food, there is often one kind of fairly straightforward explanation. It's very cheap and it's really quick and easy. And people don't have unlimited amounts of money and time. So in this kind of case, it might be, it might be that trying to steer them because you think they're harming themselves is not like the shark patters because they're not actually acting against their interests after all. So this is the kind of general, uh, one of the general tensions in thinking about paternalism, is trying to decide when you really would make people better off by restricting their options. And it's this topic that I've been thinking about for so long now that I've tried to apply to public health. So what you're getting today is a sort of potted summary of an entire very, very long book manuscript um, that you feel you should feel in no way guilty about not having bought yet because it doesn't exist. But but it will soon, and at that point you should feel guilty when you don't buy it. Um, so to go back to the ill health and public health, public health, people in public health, would like to stop people damaging their own health. From their point of view, people would be a lot healthier if they kept off the cigarettes, didn't vape, drank less alcohol, didn't eat junk food, did more exercise and stopped having unprotected sex and gambling. Um, and they would like to steer people away from these sorts of unhealthy behaviour. Now, I, I don't have any pictures of a lot of their measures. So some of them involve taxes, for instance. I don't have a picture of a tax. But cigarettes, as you know, very expensive. Um, in my country, they're about the equivalent to £20 a packet uh, of cigarettes, um, the vast bulk of which is tax. Um, there might be restrictions on availability, so uh, in some places the state owns liquor stores and then closes them on the weekend so people can't buy them. Uh, there might be density restrictions, there might be bans on certain kinds of ingredients, restrictions on offers. One of the things that I see in this country is a potential to ban bog off, which is an, an acronym for buy one, get one free for the junk food so on. So these are ways in which people might be steered into the healthy behaviour by making the unhealthy behaviour harder or more expensive. One thing I do have a picture of, though, is ghastly warnings. So, for those of you who don't smoke, which my guess is probably you all know, this is a, a photograph of a, a, the daughter of a friend of mine that I took the other day. So this is the UK one. Big warning, no brand name except at the bottom. And then um, a, a rather peculiar picture, not clear what it is, but it's obviously supposed to be kind of bad. But we have, a, we have something much more impressive in New Zealand. Um, uh, we have things like this, with great evil staring eyes of you that have gone blind and warnings in two languages, the one, one, the one you don't recognise is Māori, um, which is our indigenous language. 
basically saying, you know, you just make this, so you can look at them, you're going to get blind and die and so on. Um, in these attempts, you think, well, why would you try to make people healthier? And I think there's two main kinds of reasons that are given. These I've taken from a man called Jeffrey Rose, who was a, a well-known British epidemiologist of, um, really, we're now going back about 40 years. And he thought there was a humanitarian argument and an economic argument. The humanitarian argument is that by making people healthier, you make them better off. It is better to be healthy than ill or dead. That is the beginning and the end of the only real argument for preventive medicine. It is sufficient. So that's the humanitarian argument. He, he recognised that there was often an economic argument that was offered. If you make people healthier, they will be in some way cheaper or less harmful to others, because they say don't use up healthcare resources. Rose's view, which I think is correct, is that sometimes true and it's sometimes false. Sometimes unhealthy behaviour is cheaper than healthy behaviour. Smoking is, I think, an example of this. Um, for, the, for the reason, you know, to put it bluntly, that smokers die so young that they don't use up their pensions and they don't use up that much health care after all. So it's the humanitarian argument that I want to focus on in this talk. The idea that we should make people healthier by stopping them or discouraging them from unhealthy choices because they would be better off if they were healthier. And therefore, it's permissible to intervene and try to discourage or stop them. This kind of argument runs into the objection, the famous nanny state objection. Now, now the term nanny state is, I think, uh, probably most common in this country. But it's, it's well known in the, in the Anglo-speaking world, at least bits I've checked, um, which are my own country, Australia, uh, South Africa, India, Ireland, and the United States. So this is an advertisement, obviously pejorative, about Mayor Bloomberg, who wanted to introduce a ban on buying sugary drinks in containers larger than a medium-sized bucket. Um, and he was criticised for being a nanny. He wants to treat grown-ups like children, is the thought. Uh, the, uh, this term is apparently not really known outside English-speaking countries. One of the many pointless rabbit holes I went down uh, in writing this book I was asking anybody who spoke a language other than English whether they ever heard of a certain nanny state. So I can now reliably inform you that the answer is no, but the Spanish, Catalans, Germans, Norwegians, Danes, and the French. Um, if everybody else wants to add to this list, then, then that would be very welcome. I've got a footnote that goes on for 80 bucks. Um, the Australians have a small difference now, as well as Nanny State, called Wowser. So this is a piece of artwork from an art collective called Wowser Nation. In the view of this art collective, Australians, I don't know if we have any here tonight, Aus Australians pride themselves on being larrikins, people who stick two fingers up to authority. But really, in the opinion of Wowser Nation, they just love reducing their own freedom. They love the lash. And so one thing this art collective did was put up these fake signs, which I hope you can see, that said that, that, said that it was now mandatory to wear a helmet when jogging because of the dangers, and also set up a fake website, which is a bit hard to see at the bottom, called logyourjog.gov.au, where you were supposed to put um, in, a, in a website where you were jogging from and to, like the intentions book in a national park. Um, and uh, as some kind of evidence that Wow's a Nation were onto something in the Australian character, apparently a lot of people really did try to do this. Um, uh, so, the nanny state objection uh, is, I think, a serious objection, even if it's put in this kind of fairly jokey sort of way. Um, and what I want to try to persuade you of is that it ought to be taken seriously and that it creates, I think, a big problem for people who want to argue for the sort of public health measures I was talking about, the taxes and the bans and the restrictions and so forth. Um, so let me just say, first of all, how public health people react to the nanny state objection. And the answer is that they react badly. Uh, 
I, I quote someone called John Kem, who was the politest of the one I came across. The term nanny state is no more than a lazy rhetorical device denying the responsibility of the state for the health of its citizens. Other people in public health are even less complimentary. From their point of view, if somebody says about a public health measure proposed or actual, this is the nanny state in action, then sometimes they're being dishonest because they're really a shill for big food or big tobacco, uh, and they're not really sincere in what they say. Or they are being doctrinaire, neoliberal libertarians who believe in only a minimal state and the state shouldn't do lots of things. Or they are just an incoherent mess. So a kind of favorite tactic in public health is to list all sorts of regulations that we all agree are really good. Like, isn't it a good thing that we're not allowed to buy TB-infected milk? Isn't it a good thing that we have compulsory sanitation? So unlike the old days where you emptied it out of a window, shouting garde to uh, any unlucky people underneath, now it goes through pipes and so on. You're not allowed to do this sort of thing. These are good things. We ban asbestos. We ban child pornography. These are good things. How can you then, this is the reply, how can you object to the nanny state? If you do, you have to object to these as well. So the implication is that um, either you're completely doctrinaire or dishonest. We shouldn't. We should not have bans on, on offers of junk food, and we shouldn't ban asbestos. Or you're just being incoherent. Well, I, I think um, there's zero chance of this objection coming off. Uh, there seems like there's, you know, if you had to go through a list, many, many objections, differences between banning asbestos on the one hand and banning buy one, get one free offers for beer or junk food on the other. You know, asbestos is inflicted on people without their consent or knowledge. You can breathe it and not know. It's much more dangerous because if you do breathe it, then you're very, very likely to have a nasty death and so on. The list goes on. Um, so I think this attempt to just sort of knock the objection out of the park at the start isn't going to work. And in fact, I think we can see three uh, distinct components in the nanny state objection which ought to be taken seriously. One of these is healthism, the second is autonomy, and the third I call scepticism. The healthism idea is that the people who want these sort of nanny state restrictions overvalue health. Health is not as important as they think it is. That's the thing I'll talk about in, the, in most of the rest of this lecture. The second objection is autonomy. The idea of autonomy is that people should be able to run their own lives, free from interference by others. That includes being free to go to hell in their own way. This, I think, is the idea expressed by you're treating us like children when you nanny us. We're adults, you're treating us like children, and you shouldn't do that. And the third is what I call scepticism, which is the idea that people in public health either don't know what they're doing, or they can't be trusted to do it, or that even if they can be trusted to do it, the state can't be trusted to act on their behalf. And people who make this objection have many examples in mind, which I think should give everyone at least pause for thought. So um, uh, back in the 1980s, I remember when I, when I went to the United States, the great fear at the time was dietary fat. Uh, that we were, our landlord lady forced upon us this tub, which I should say she made us pay for as well, forced upon us this tub of reformulated ice cream that had no fat in it. It only had loads and loads of sugar. It tasted disgusting, and of course, from now, the current perspective, it's the sugar that's the really bad thing. And we'll all be familiar with these sorts of scares that come and go over time. This thing is good for you, this thing is bad for you, this thing was good for you last week, but it's bad for you this week, and so on. So there's that. Um, there are cases where certain public health measures have indeed shall we say, backfired. So the, probably the most obvious example of this is the prohibition of alcohol in the United States. So the United States uh, has, uh, since 1789, moved from being um, a few eastern seaboard uh, slave-owning agricultural colonies to an extremely large, very rich, non-slave-owning democracy. And yet, during this period of massive transition, has somehow managed to have only 27 amendments to its constitution. 
Two of these are on alcohol. One introducing prohibition, and another one, really not very long afterwards, repealing the prohibition of alcohol, because it was such an unmitigated disaster. Now, I'm prepared to bet almost none of you um, would know about the disastrous Soviet anti-alcohol campaign of the 1980s, but I can talk about that at length if anyone wants to know. We also had the Danish fat tax fiasco of 2011 to 2013, where the Danes introduced a tax on saturated fat, which meant everyone just drove to Germany to buy their fat instead. Um, it was introduced unanimously in 2011 and repealed with a massive majority two years later as a total disaster. Um, now, I don't actually endorse the sceptical view, which is that you can't trust public health um, or they don't know what they're doing. I think all these stories should give us pause for thought, but I don't think the real, the real truth is that they just always are going to get it wrong. So just by way of one little example, um, as you know, smoking is banned in bars, restaurants, pubs, and so forth, um, in this country, in my country, in Italy. Many people thought that this would be a public policy failure, particularly in Italy, where Italians have their own rather peculiar and robust relationship to obeying the law. And yet, it worked like a charm. Now, whatever the merits of it as an intervention, it was not a public policy failure in the sense that it quickly had rapid side effects that nobody had foreseen and had to be got rid of, sharpish. So it's not like prohibition of alcohol. And I think, in general, some public health measures will do what people in public health genuinely want, which is make people healthier. I just still think there are these other two questions about it, one of which is the healthism and the other is the autonomy. So let me talk about the healthism, the one for the rest of this talk. Healthism is the idea that we are, or public health people, are overvaluing health. Health is not as important as they think it is. I now want to give you three what I regard as truisms. That is, they're both true, uh, they're obviously true, um, that, which I will explain, of course, uh, that I think get overlooked. One is that health is only one good thing in a life amongst many. Another is that health is not the supreme good. That it could be that you lose some health, but what you gain in something else is so much greater that you end up being better off. And the third is that the importance of some aspect of health varies from person to person. Let me illustrate these abstract truisms. I want to begin with a tear-jerking example. I actually made this example up because the truth is less tear-jerking, as I will shortly disclose. But in this slightly adapted example, this is from a colleague of mine in Dunedin. Her, grandfa her, 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 her father had had a, a transplant. And because he was on a transplant, he had to take anti-rejection medication, which meant he was immunocompromised, a term we all know now. He was immunocompromised. Should he play with those little wandering disease vectors, his grandchildren. And he decided that he would play with his grandchildren because he wanted to play with his grandchildren, not because he had some complicated story about how his mental health would in the end benefit from this and it would outweigh the risk and so on. He was willing to risk his health for the sake of playing with his grandchildren. That seems perfectly intelligible to me. It's not in fact true. In the real example, the grandfather decided not to play with his grandchildren, um, which probably tells you something about his attachment to his grandchildren and to his, and to his health. And that makes the point that, although the first story is very plausible, people can quite reasonably vary in how they value some aspect of their health. The second kind of examples are the ones that we would be thinking of in the, in the context of this lecture, which is drinking alcohol is nice. Smoking, if you're a smoker, is nice. You get something out of it. Eating junk food can be nice. People who hate exercise, hate exercise. Um, and just kind of moving around for them is constantly miserable. If they don't do the optimal for their health, that may be because they're getting more out of it. The intermediate example between the sort of the unhealthy behaviour that public health people focus on on the one hand and the tearjerker on the other is sport. So I train in a high-performance gym. Um, everyone in this gym is high-performance except for me. Uh, and it consists of weightlifters, javelin throwers, pole vaulters, discus throwers, shot-put throwers. In some cases, up to Olympic medalist standard. 
they are always either injured or they've just been injured or they're just about to get injured. Because elite sport is not about health, it is about winning. And they know this, and yet, in pursuit of their goals, which seem to me perfectly reasonable goals, they are willing to risk their health. Now, I want to give you an example of this, and this is a, I use this example everywhere because I'm so impressed by it, but it's particularly apposite here, because you probably all know this chap. Do you all know this chap? I mean, I know what, I know what Staffordshire's like. The guy who drove me in the taxi from the station is the training partner of Eddie Hall, and he looked like it, actually. He could barely fit in the taxi. Um, so there's Eddie Hall, a photograph picking up 500 kilograms from the floor, first man to do it in 2016. This is a photo of him doing it a bit closer up. So you can see the blood bursting out of his nose, and you can see, let's just say, he's going through an episode of high blood pressure. Um, in fact, blood streamed from his nose, eyes, and ears. He temporarily lost his vision, kept losing consciousness, and paramedics couldn't even measure his blood pressure, and he thought he was going to die. It took four hours for his heart rate to level out. Um, the next day, he couldn't work out how to drive his car. At his son's birthday party, he couldn't recognize people who were there. He had several pool vertebrae and bad bruising. Um, when he was asked if he'd ever, you know, if he, would he go through it all again, he said, of course I would, but I'd add 10 kilos on. So, I mean, I find this perfectly intelligible, but here's a way of putting it. I should also say that he did eat 12,500 calories a day in order to be able to put on enough sheer mass, not just muscle, but sheer mass to do this. You know, you have to eat meals in the middle of the night. It's ghastly. Um, and uh, a way to take this thought is, here is somebody who knows the risks and willingly undergoes them because that is the price he has to pay in order to achieve something he considers particularly valuable. But not everybody would be willing to do that. So these are the reasons why I would want to say you can be better off with less health rather than more if you achieve something more valuable. Health is not the only good. It is not the supreme good. But the value of some aspect of health varies from person to person. This then leads to a challenge to public health. And the challenge is this. When people do make these unhealthy choices, when they smoke, drink alcohol, vape, eat junk food, drink sugary drinks, have unprotected sex, don't exercise, gamble, they are all acting. It is all goal-directed behavior. So, um, you know, I don't know when you last had your reflexes tested, you know, when you put your knee on like this and you kind of up it, it goes forward, uh, like that. Um, that's not an action. That's just, it just happens. It's not because of the pursuit of a goal. But drinking is not a disease of the elbow. It's not, you go, well, how did that happen? <laughs> it's goal-directed behavior. So people are doing this because they think they're getting something out of it. And it raises a challenge for public health, which is, why think given that people are choosing to do these things, why think you would make them better off and not worse off by stopping them doing it? I should say I do not think this challenge is unanswerable, but I do think that people in public health have not been very good at answering it. Over and over again, when one hears an argument for a public health restriction of some sort, attacks, the ban on bog off, whatever it might be, don't eat junk food in public transport. When you hear the arguments for this, or it has to be said, read them in journal articles, which have been peer-reviewed and so forth, they usually have a structure that's roughly like this. X is unhealthy, therefore we ought to discourage or stop X. To which a reply is, it's unhealthy, but maybe people like it and they get more out of it than they lose. You have to say more than just, it's unhealthy. You have to say more than just, it's unhealthy, and this measure would genuinely stop it. You have to show that what they gain by being made healthier outweighs what they lose by not being able to do the thing they would otherwise choose to do. And that step, that essential step, 
is usually missing. Not always. Sometimes there are some sort of kind of fairly half-hearted attempts to argue for the importance of health. So one is to argue that you've got to have your health or you can't do anything in life. Health is the necessary precondition for, and then you fill in the blanks, having a meaningful relations with people, being able to work, um, being able to uh, reflect on the kind of person you really are. This is the sort of thing only philosophers would say, really, but they do say it. Well, here's a counterexample. So this is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt is in a wheelchair. This is one of the very rare photographs of him. He um, probably had polio, but, and this is another of those rabbit holes I went down, he may have had Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, that, that took a whole morning, I think. Um, uh, but anyway, he can't walk. He can't walk. And yet, this did not stop him winning four presidential elections in the United States. Admittedly, he did die shortly after the beginning of the fourth, but that's hardly surprising in the circumstances because he'd killed himself through overwork in, the, in helping to win the Second World War. It's just not the case that um, you have to have all your health in order to be able to do anything worthwhile. What that kind of argument seems to envisage is that health is either on or off. Either you're completely healthy or you're dead or comatose. But everybody, or pretty much everybody, is in some sort of falling short. You know, you can go to work when you've got a cold. I managed to write this book with knee tendinopathy. Um, you can still do things, and so it's just an open question whether what you lose in health can be made up for by something else you might be able to do. Um, so let me say having just criticised people in public health for not really facing up to the challenge, the challenge that says, look, people choose to do these things, why think you're going to make them better off by making them healthier? Having, they don't, having, having they haven't confronted this, I think, properly. So let me suggest how it might be answered, and then let me suggest about whether it really can be. I think if you're going to criticise someone's choices and say, look, you're choosing to do something unhealthy and it's against your interests, then you've got to say, you're making a mistake. They've got to be making some sort of a mistake. And there are, roughly speaking, two sorts of mistake they might make. They might be wrong about the facts, they just don't know how unhealthy it is, or they might have some sort of motivational problem, such as giving in to temptation. I mean, every, we're all human, so I'm sure we've all done it. You know, the Pringles crisps that seem to mysteriously disappear, the bag of cashew nuts that you absentmindedly look down on and realise there's only one left, that kind of a thing. Um, and there's, so you give in to a temptation, a sort of motivational problem. With the factual ones, the ones where people don't know how unhealthy it is, personally I have my doubts about whether this now explains much in the way of unhealthy behaviour, and so do a lot of people in public health. But if it were a problem, there's an obvious answer. And the answer is to give people information. Now, people in public health often say giving information doesn't change behaviour, but I think they've forgotten some historical examples. One is smoking. When it was announced that smoking caused lung cancer in 1954 in this country, um, people gave up smoking in very large numbers. Before bans on marketing, before tax was raised high, before any of these hiding it behind shelves and so forth, when people found out that smoking was dangerous, a lot of them gave up. So that's a sign that giving information can change behaviour. Here's another. Um, this is an advertisement for Dr. Bull's cough syrup. Now, before 1906, in the American Pure Food and Drug Act, uh, it was not only legal to sell patent medicines containing powerful drugs... Uh, you didn't even have to disclose it. So Dr. Bull's cough syrup contained morphine sulfate. I mean, people seem to spend the whole of the 19th century getting high on patent drugs. Um, one, of the, one of the great campaigners for temperance, for prohibition in the United States, used to enjoy her evening tonic. It made her feel so much better. She didn't know it was 20% alcohol. No wonder it made her feel better. Anyway, after the Pure Food and Drug Act, it was still legal to sell them but now you had to disclose what was in them. 
So here you can see that we have cocaine toothache drops. Uh, and one effect of disclosing was to greatly reduce demand. So we're talking about you know, seriously addictive drugs here, and yet a lot of people just stopped when they found out. Anyway, I think one, there's a number of things we could conclude from this. One is, from the point of view of a lot of people, smoking was a mistake. They didn't know the facts. When they found out, they stopped. When people took Dr. Bull's cough syrup, they were making a factual mistake. They didn't know it had this drug in. When they found out, they stopped. But the general point is that if there's a factual mistake, if people just don't know, then the answer on the face of it looks like, give them the information. I realize things are slightly more complicated than that, but that's an answer. The second are the motivational problems, that people are tempted to act against their better interests as they themselves judge them. And this then says, look, even from your own point of view, given what you yourself really care about, you think you shouldn't do this. You think you should be healthier. Now, there is, I think, some very striking evidence that supports an assessment like this in the case of smoking. But it's striking for two reasons. It's striking in being about smoking. And it's striking because there's nothing similar that I know of or anything else. So, in the case of smoking, if you ask smokers, do you wish you hadn't started, or worse to that effect, very, very high numbers say yes. Between 70 and 90% of smokers say they wish they'd never started. Even quite soon after, they've only been starting a relatively short time, or they've only recently given up. Even quite young smokers will say this. Um, and this is cross-culturally true. So the evidence I've seen comes from this country, my country, Australia, Canada, the United States, China, Malaysia, South Korea, and Thailand. Um, these are you know, a big array of different countries. And I think when it's combined with other evidence about how smokers often try to quit, um, they regard themselves as addicted and so forth, it adds up to a picture of people who are doing something they think is bad for them and they find it very hard to stop. And this, I think, is the strongest case um, that, that I know of for saying, OK, look, maybe these restrictions on choice, the massive cigarette taxes and so forth, maybe these things don't actually make people worse off. Maybe they make smokers better off by giving them what they really want. But the other striking thing, as I said, is that we don't really have evidence of this for the junk food, the drinking, the lack of exercise, and so forth. Um, partly, I think, because people haven't been asked. But actually, informally, when I talk to uh, colleagues who work on alcohol, one thing they think is the big problem for them is that people dislike drinking. Um, I mean, not everybody, of course. Some people definitely don't. Some people are, uh, are in the grips of an addiction they would really like to shake off. But most people are not like that. Most people like, like their drink. Um, when it comes to weight loss, only a small minority of people are trying to lose weight at any given time. Um, and at least for the United States figures, there's a sort of uh, class correlation. Actually, the poorer people are, the less likely they are to be trying to lose weight, possibly because all they can afford is, is, the, is the unhealthy stuff that is cheap and easy to cook and so forth. They don't have much money or time. They will be made worse off on this story by restricting their options to buy that. So let me just, let me just try to sum up here. Um, I think the big problem for public health people is to say, how and why do you think that restricting people's options by taxing, banning, and whatnot, why think it'll make people better off, not worse off? You can't say it makes them healthier, because something can make them healthier, but worse off. You have to find evidence that when people make their choices for unhealthy things, they're making some sort of a mistake. And so far, the only evidence I've really come across is in the case of smoking. Now, that leaves it open that there is evidence there for other things as well. It's just no one's looked yet. In which case, I guess my, my, my recommendation would be time to start looking. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, that's me. That's great. Thank you very much, Martin. Right, um, we can open...
this up to questions now. Um, I dare say we'll have a few. Um, so if you raise your hands, we have a, a roving mic team uh, at the back, and they'll come to you with a microphone. Uh, so um, uh, yes, we've got um, someone at the back there in the blue shirt. Uh, Brilliant. Uh, thank you for a very interesting and stimulating talk. Um, I've got two questions, if I may, so maybe first one, and then if there's any others, but if not, I'll ask my second one. Um, so I think linking into some of the, the discussions or the items you raised in terms of potentially, I guess, less so tobacco, but maybe more so in terms of sort of healthy eating and exercise options and, and situations like that. I guess given the geographic and, and social factors that are shaping where people live and the environments they are, um, how much choice do you think people really have or freedom over these sorts of factors that maybe would affect sort of, as I say, sort of diet options or exercise options or other things that maybe would affect their health? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, well, I think in some cases the answer is not much. So my point is very much not everyone's got loads of options. It's that for whatever option set they have, don't make their option set even worse than it was before. Um, now, I'm not saying this applies actually to some of the points about, about places you can exercise and so forth. Um, but the thought, I don't, know if I, I don't know if the thought needs to be explaining any more, but um, uh, if somebody hasn't got very many options, because all they can afford, they can either afford cheap, they've either got cheap unhealthy food, for instance, or there's expensive healthy food, and you whack a tax on, all it does is turn the cheap, unhealthy food into expensive, unhealthy food. That makes them w that worse off and have fewer options than they otherwise would. So it's a point about, it's not a point about leave everything the way it is. It's just fine. It's, you know, maybe you should think about improving people's options. You know, maybe, for instance, by cash transfers or whatever it might be. But don't burden them even further. Uh, thank you. Yes, Trevor, your hands up. Can I just ask where the third party impacts sort of come into the, the calculation? So in the case of smoking, the, the secondary smoking argument or, or even the, you know, the comfort of the environment of other people or you know, in the case of vaccination, you know, putting too many kids, the, the population and the herd impact and, and all of those sorts of things. Um, that must affect the sort of public health opinions on such things. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and so, so, I mean, obviously I've picked up on what I think is a leading argument for certain public health measures. So on the, on the third party effects, um, it's easy to see how some public health measures address third party effects. So bans on smoking in cars with children, for instance or a third-party effect controlling kind of measure. But I can't see how one would get a high tax, for instance, or a ban on public display, or cigarette warnings, or any of those sorts of things out of a concern about third parties. They're clearly targeted at the smokers themselves, I think, for their sake. Um, so, I, so my feeling is that some of these, some of the, uh, the public health, if you want the full suite, let's put it this way, if you want the full suite of public health measures that people in public health want, you'll be able to justify, potentially justify, a subset of these by appealing to third-party considerations, and that will leave a large number that can't be justified by third-party considerations. But aren't you then blurring tactic with strategy, almost? You know, the, the, in order to stop someone smoking, even if you're doing it because you want to reduce the impact on somebody else, the best way of doing it, actually, is to emphasise the uh, well, um, so here's the, way, here's the way we in philosophy tend to think about this. Um, there's more than one reason for a policy. Some of these reasons might be good reasons and other reasons might be bad reasons. So if we break down these reasons one by one, is this a good reason, is this a bad reason? So my thought is just, suppose the policy in question is a high tax on cigarettes or a sugar tax. Um, is, it, is it a good reason for this that it's going to have bad third-party effects? No. It's not, it might be a good reason to ban smoking over other people. It's not a good reason just to push the price of the product up. Um, 
So that reason is out. That then, and so that only leaves the other reason is, does it make them better off? To which I think actually in the case of cigarettes it might do. But in the case of other things it doesn't do, in which case you've now got no reasons left, so you shouldn't do it. I don't know if this... I mean, I'm interested in the kind of the strategy tactic distinction, but I suspect it's kind of cross-cutting across the thing I'm talking about. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, Pauline, your hand here. Uh, and then we we'll have a, another question here. Thank you. Um, as somebody who's spent their career sort of in health or healthcare education, but also has an academic interest in ethics, it's uh, an interesting place. And I think I get what you're saying about paternalism versus autonomy. And, and, you know, the potential of the nanny state in public health. But, but actually, what, what we've not really addressed is what if we don't do some of the public health things? And actually, if you were then looking at those, um, you know, what's the right thing to do? Um, which one has the greatest impact or the greatest impacts on the greatest amount of people, etc. So I think there's more to it than necessarily just, you know, um, what do people, you know, what is the actual good for an individual? And I just wonder how, you know, because I think part of what we need to do when we think and talk like this is think, well, you know, what should we do? What could we do? So, you know, when I'm assuming you're not saying public health shouldn't happen, um, how do you see that actually we could take forward a public health agenda in a way that doesn't maybe make, have this perception of nanny state or, or enables choice? Um, thank you. Uh, I, th I think there's a number of different thoughts that you, you have there. Um, I mean, perhaps one thing I should say is I'm not here in this, in this talk, I'm not just saying um, it's paternalism versus autonomy. Um, I mean, I think it's another, another reason not to interfere with people is because people should be able to run their own lives if they're grown-ups, although that reason sometimes is outweighed. What I'm trying to do here is to say, actually, even if you stop them doing it, you're going to, in some cases, make them worse off. So I suppose I think, well, if you are going to make them worse off, what's the reason to do that? It might be there are some sort of beneficial third-party effects, and sometimes there will be and sometimes there won't be. So if a policy just does make people worse off and it has no beneficial effects on anybody else, then the answer is that you shouldn't do it. Um, how much of public health is left you know, it would remain to be seen, but clearly I think vast amounts will be left. Schools education, childhood vaccination, sanitation programmes, disease surveillance, all these sorts of things, and health education and information. People have to know, you know how they can be healthier if they want to and what it is that might make them unhealthier. So an awful lot might, be, might still be left. Um, the things I'm most sort of doubtful about are the ones that reduce people's options which I think a tax does, because obviously if it's, if it's more expensive and you've got a limited budget, you can buy less things, or bans and so on. Personally, I'm a bit less worried about health promotion being nanny-ish and so on. I don't know if this fully, fully answers what you're saying, but I'm certainly not saying we should get rid of public health. And I don't really have any suggestions for how public health can advance what it wants without being accused of the nanny state, because that would require a sensitivity to other people's feelings that I probably lack. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do, do you wish to tell us your question? Then we've got more questions appearing in the room as well. So, just here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Martin. Um, I'm going to start from a, from a base where I feel that individual could actually take responsibility for themselves being accountable. I think when we have a state where um, we've been told to do certain things and follow, and by following that food system of cultural effect and now the kids have been told what to do 
um, being wearing pink, if you're a girl, wearing blue, if you're a boy. I mean, they also contribute to the way we sabotage ourselves in terms of how we make decisions because you've just been forced to think in a certain way. And that method of thinking actually impacts making decisions for oneself overall. I mean, it's more in general, in general terms, but it affects our lives, everyday lives, in, in the choice we do, should we drink or not drink, or should we jump off the bridge or not? Because it's exciting to, to do those things, to draw attention. My question now is, what are we lacking to, to do the wrong thing to ourselves, to sabotage ourselves? Is there some kind of psychological um, neurosis or anything so stupid that makes us continue to act this way? Um, well, I, that, that is uh, such an interesting question, actually. Uh, And I don't know what point we'll start disagreeing with each other. So let me say, why do people pat sharks? Goodness knows. Um, that seemed fairly self-sabotaging to me and probably to you. Um, why do some people seem unable to take pleasure in things and seem to want to punish themselves? This is a thing that might be close to what you mean by, I think you said neurosis. I might be, I might be projecting onto you. Um, uh, you know, there are certain ways, you know, when you get into psychology, there are certain ways in which... You think people just, some people just make their lives unhappy. Why? And sometimes the answer, I think, is that so there's some individual thing going on, or it might be in the family thing or something like that. Um, and they do, these sorts of things do give pause for thought to people like me who are inclined to think that, on the whole, people don't make dumb mistakes. Um, uh, but then there's sort of where culture fits into this is quite tricky, really. You know, if you live in a culture, where you, where you drink lots of beer and socialise, for instance, which is the culture I grew up in, you know, um, if I'd been in a different culture, I wouldn't have done that. So I did something that was probably unhealthy compared with at least some other cultures. But I did like it, and I'm glad I did it. And part of what's worthwhile for me is doing this kind of thing in this cultural milieu I was brought up in. So it stops being a kind of constraint on my well-being and a component of it, I think. So, I, so there must be a way in which cultures can make people act against their interests through the presentation of their options and the way they're brought up. But I think it's quite tricky to be able to characterise when that is the case. So I, the, yours is too deep in some ways but for me to think through on my feet. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Uh, OK, we, we, uh, we've got numerous people now. Um, so um, I, I saw Soterios, your hand went up. First, uh, then we have, I'm sorry, I don't know your, your name, uh, in, the, in the red dress. And then, um, uh, again, sorry, I don't know your name, but you already asked a question, so I'm deprioritising you until the, uh, uh, until the other two uh, have asked the question. So, Soterios, please. Uh. Right. Um, one observation and probably two questions, I'll be, but I'll be very quick. Um, sometimes when we talk about people taking uh, risks about their lives, we look at uh, people with lower financial classes, so they are, as you mentioned, cheaper food. Maybe it's not the best food. They choose it. But people make choices, uh, bizarre choices, even when they are not restricted by financial purely reasons, like we are reading today and yesterday about the Titan, these four guys, <clears throat> one of them CEO, really. I wouldn't like to be in his company. Um, he went so down in the sea, right, in the submarine. That's a very risky thing, isn't it? Um, not very different from those that try to touch the, uh, the jaws. So there is something always in the psychology of people, I believe, that they will look for something different, whatever the state, uh, none or not, try to restrict them. Um, I don't know how I can explain that in ethical views, but in psychology, it, it is always there. That's an observation in general that is not only, what I meant with that is not only about the people of financial limits, but it's also something about the psychology of human beings. Um, you mentioned about the argument, the humanitarian argument and the economic argument. And you rightly say the economic argument has two sides, of course, two sides in the story, that people that, uh, for instance, that they do in a healthy life might die earlier and uh, they will save the 
state from many expenses, for, for instance. Healthcare as well, not only the pension. But do we have really statistics about that? It, that's a good, I mean, it, it's a good guess, but do we have statistics to see when, which side saves more money? Uh, the side uh, where we put the economic incentive to live a healthier life or the side which allows them to live as they like? You, you see what I mean? Does it make sense? Uh, and the humanitarian argument, here I have a question, if you have time to answer this, I didn't understand eventually, do you agree with the humanitarian argument or not? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, uh, statistics, um, are there statistics, at least for smoking? Um, uh, yes, there are. I saw a uh, Finnish longitudinal study of smokers tracked them over 25 something years and the smokers cost more in any given year in healthcare but they lose, used up significantly um, less healthcare cost in aggregate because they live shorter lives. Um, there's an undeniable saving in the pensions because of the shortfall in life expectancy. Um, the New Zealand Treasury, which usually casts a cold and cynical eye over most things, said there's no economic case for more taxes on cigarettes now. In fact, they're a bit worried the taxes might go too high and rob them of some revenue um, because people then stop smoking. Uh, so I think there is for that. I, the others, I think, are all a bit murkier um, about the effects. I suspect that the costs of drinking are, are probably larger. Um, if people drank less, then there would probably be some kind of saving in third-party costs. Um, but so, so there are, but it's murky and disputable and it often involves complicated issues about how much of a discount rate to apply over time, which is usually plucked from people's bottoms in some way or another, but produces very different results. So that's that. On the humanitarian argument, do I agree with it? No, I don't. I don't agree. Well, I agree it's better to be healthier than ill or dead, other things equal, um, but it depends. It depends what you stand to lose by doing whatever it is that makes you healthier. And sometimes that outweighs what you gain from being healthier. So I don't agree that this is a sufficient argument for, for public health restrictions. Um, you need more. Uh, probably I shouldn't comment on the observation because I think there's more people, although very interesting it was about the man who sank to the bottom of the earth, because um, I think there might be more questions. So. If you've got a relevant point, please, please. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? about why billionaires do this thing. Steve Fossett kept disappearing until he disappeared um, by, in a balloon crash. So, I mean, I think, I don't, I don't regard, I mean, it's, in some way it seems bizarre to some of us who don't fancy this kind of thing, but people, base jumpers, for instance, who go jumping off bridges, antennae, span on the earth, it's an acronym, you know, they just love this kind of thing and there's no glory in it for them. There's no money in it for them. They just really like it. And some people just, I mean, in general, people like doing things which are at the absolute edge of their abilities, but they can do. Um, but that's a general, seems to be a general feature about people. And for some people, given the nature of their abilities and their interests, that just turns out to be things which are really dangerous. Um, there might be another signaling function as well. I mean, if you're a billionaire, it must be quite hard to impress people after a while. You know, you need so many Rolexes you can wear. So you have to do something really dangerous, and that makes you stand out in some way. That's, a, that's another explanation I've read for why rich people sometimes do these things. Um, again, that's an, un, unfortunately, that's a sort of non-bizarre, non perfectly normal human element of psychology, which is the desire to stand out in some kind of way. That's my observation on the observation. Excellent. We could, we could keep going down that rabbit hole, but we'll stop. Yes, next question. Thanks very much. Thank you, Martin. That's really interesting. Um, as a nurse by background and a district nurse, um, I think it's interesting to have the conversation about people who have choices, but there are many people who don't have choices, and I think that public health has an obligation to empower people. So we, we profile communities, and within Stoke-on-Trent, we have a variance of 15 years in life outcomes, you know, in, in mortality. But we also have people that have no choices about diet. If you're immobile or you have no transport, there might be 10 chip shops, but no fruit and vegetable. And my students profile communities, and that is the case. And, and I think because public health outcomes are often years ahead, it can be um, underfunded by the government. So we are seeing stripping back of health visiting and obese children, mental health in adolescence, because there isn't the investment, because it will be a number of years that we, we see that impact. 
So where is public health's obligation to those that don't have those choices? So it's great if you're a billionaire and you can choose to impress, but if you have nothing, we need a society that maybe is a nanny state that can enable people to make choices that they haven't got the resource to be able to make themselves. We have a reading age of 10 to 12 years in the UK. Is the information that's given to people in a readable state? Is it something they can make those choices for the majority? So should we have a nanny state to an extent to support people to make those choices? OK, thank you. Um, uh, my mother was a health visitor, actually. And she stopped being a health visitor when they started cutting it all back. This would be about 15, 20 years ago. Um, well, it, uh, the answer to your question is, should we have a nanny state, depends on what you want to stick in, what you call a nanny state. So, should you make information available to people in a form they can understand? Of course. Um, when we talk about enabling people's choices, which bits are we talking about? Are you, if we're offering them the choice of healthy food if they can't get out and about, as well as the choice of unhealthy food, that's more enabling than just offering unhealthy food. I've got no objection to increasing people's options. Um, uh, I mean, in general, I, I'm inclined to think that if, if you took, stood, took a, a, stood back from public health and looked at a problem that some people live in poverty, one kind of answer which might seem a bit too pat is, but it's a, it's a respectable tradition in thinking about this, is the problem with poverty is a lack of money. And the answer is to give people some. And so it might, and it contrasts with a kind of approach that wants to, in effect, supervise people's choices. Say, no, no, you're making the wrong choice. We want you to make, the, we think you should make this choice. So some of the enabling might be outside the scope of public health because it might be a cash transfer kind of thing, or whatever it might be. Um, so I'm not sure, so, so I suppose the question for you, um, not that you have to answer it, of course, um, the question for you if you want enabling is what do you mean by enabling? Because if you're putting people in a position where they can genuinely choose because they know what's going on, good. If you want to improve people's choices by giving them options, good. But if it comes to the, the slogan, make the healthy option the easy option, the flip side of that is make the unhealthy option the hard option. And that kind of thing I don't, would not regard as enabling. But that's the kind of the sugar tax and so forth. Good, good, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so um, I, I, I did uh, say I was deep I think, but you've had your hand up for a long time at, at the back of the blue shirt. Then we have Tim and we also have Kevin there as well. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. Um, so it links in with one or two questions that have come before the gentleman at the front and, and the question before as well. And I, I guess digging deeper into, I guess, the principles of ethics, thinking how autonomy can kind of clash with non-maleficence, sort of do, do no harm. And thinking maybe not so much on a big societal-wide level, but thinking more in terms of healthcare contacts um, and also how different people can have different views and actually healthcare workers, clinicians, um, can have one view as to what a healthy option is or a positive treatment that would improve health can be and how actually a patient may have a, a different view of that. Um, I guess it's thinking how that, that balance can kind of be reached in terms of when there are different views as to what is valued in terms of an outcome but there is a system or an education or a health, a health police model that we're training people in that says, actually, no, this is what health is, this is what the selection of outcomes or treatments that you can use are, regardless of whether you think that will be positive for yourself, that's what I can offer. And I guess the flip side of that, how far should clinicians who are trained in that be willing to step outside of that scope to say, I'm willing to help you to manage the risk of your decision that I think is unwise or isn't beneficial for your health? Um, uh, I'd like to say you're at the edge of my competence, but I think you're actually over the edge into my incompetence. Um, because you are asking, I mean, you're asking a number of questions, but they're clearly about medical practice. Um, so, you know, if, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a doctor, say you, wanted to persuade me to stop smoking dope, and you said, you know, pointed out the dangers, or don't take anabolic steroids, for instance, because of the cardiomyopathy, and you kind of tell me these things, and you say, you know, you get the impression I'm being too insouciant about this, and you say, you know, you kind of push it a bit. Um, I, I, I find it hard to see that my autonomy is being infringed upon in this kind of a way. 
Um, I, think, I think people get sometimes get a bit too precious about, about autonomy. Uh, about as though, you know, people have got these completely well worked out views that they want to pursue and that even giving them advice in some way is presumptuous. I mean, I agree it can be in some cases and you shouldn't keep ringing me up at home and badgering me and so forth. But, um, uh, I mean, I think, I, I, I think people sometimes just read these th principles too crudely. So I'm not sure that's a complete answer and I certainly can't answer about the right way you know, what's the most effective way of doing this or should you step out of your training or things like that is a bit too... It requires too much knowledge that I don't have, I think. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, Tim, please, uh, just, just here, if you can... Uh, have you only got the one part? Uh, oh, you've got a mic. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Where did that come thanks. from? <laughs> it, was, it just happened to be on the table here. Thanks, Anthony, and thanks, Martin. A great talk. Uh, can I just bring in uh, a member of our online audience? Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a question I think that probably takes off from, from Julie's question and it's a, from Peter in the online audience. And I've got a kind of gloss which I think, or, or, which I'll perhaps add on at the end. Uh, so, so Peter's saying, um, you, you've concentrated on the individual, but what about the good of the most, i.e. population effects like wealth and equality, well illustrated in COVID, where we were doing something as individuals for the public good. Uh, even if the individual risk of harm was low. And, and this is my gloss, if I may. I hope I've got Peter right, or I'm sort of extending that thought or adding to that thought. So you, you, when you were talking about healthism, you said the importance of health varies from person to person. Would you also say that it, it varies perhaps from nation to nation? So in some nations, there may be a much stronger case for an anti-state than others. Uh, right. Is that the gloss, that last part, do you think? Yeah, yeah okay, okay. Um, uh, the conclusion might be true that, um, that there's more of a case for a nanny state in some places than others, um, but probably not, possibly not the reason. So my, his, his, just to, to kind of rehash the thought, it goes, health is not the only good. You could make people worse off by making them healthier. On the other hand, people might act against their interests by doing something unhealthy. They might act against their interests by doing something too healthy as well, come to that, because they're neurotic. But suppose they act against their interests. They've got a motivational problem. They keep giving in to temptation. If, I, if you had a nation of people who gave in to temptation all the time versus ones who are you know, completely capable of pursuing their own interests, the one where everyone's giving in to temptation, there's more of a case for a nanny state. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the state where health is more important to those people. It could be the ones where health is really important to people. They're already health fanatics, living off raw carrots and kale shakes and things like that. They don't need a nanny state. So I think, yes, it could be that there's more of a case for a nanny state in some places than others. It depends upon people's attitudes to their own behaviour. But not because, or not just because, health is more important to some people than others, or some people's than others. Thank you. Yes. Kevin, right at the back, please. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, so you talked about um, public health policies that enlarge the kind of choices and alternatives that people have, um, and, and that, that you, know, you, you would uh, sort of be in agreement with those. However, also, I think those choices uh, do put burdens and might restrict the um, the alternatives of other people and other actors in society, for example, those who run businesses or big corporations. And I suspect that that's the reason why uh, the nanny state is so problematic in some cir uh, uh, okay. in some circles, for example, in the US. Uh, um, and the reason why that the expression the nanny state has been coined probably in in the first place. Um, for example, it, uh, my uh, local shop down the road in Silverdale has an entire aisle of bacon and you literally find three apples that, uh, uh, and they run out of apples at 9.30 in the morning. So my, what I would like to do there, you know, if I would be in government would, would be to say, well, you know, I'll, uh, I'll pass a law that uh, obliges shop to have a certain percentage of vegetables um, or, or other options on top 
off the bacon. Uh, and then if people are not buying it now, you'll, you know, you run the business and you'll put in place all sorts of campaigns to incentivize people to buy those products so that you can sell them. Um, but yeah, of course the person who runs the shop, and, and of course I'm not taking away the bacon there, you know, I'm just adding something else. But those people will say, well actually, the people who run the shop will say, well, look, apples are perishable, uh, we are in a moment on sort of rising costs, our um, you know, bill for energy you know, has, has skyrocketed, our margins have decreased, and we're not really sure that we're gonna sell those apples. So, again, how, how would that restriction of people's freedom and other sort of people uh, in different roles in society fit into, into your sort of argument? Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, perhaps, perhaps if I talk about the kind of the merits of an idea that says you've got to sell apples, um, you, a question would be, why aren't they? So I think there's an explanation in, that's sometimes offered of a partial explanation of obesity rates in the United States, which is the idea of a food desert. I don't know if it's a term here, but it's the kind of thing you were talking about where there's any chip shops nearby. Um, I should say in New Zealand we have a, um, which is, has quite high fatness rates. Um, we have no food deserts at all. Uh, the poor areas have better access in some ways to fresh fruit and vegetables than the richer areas because they're urban. Never mind. Um, so suppose you had a, so you decided, okay, we're going to we're going to make shops sell healthy stuff and then people can choose. Now this must have a, some sort of a cost, otherwise the shops would already have done it. So it's not that it's not that there's a sort of sinister capitalist conspiracy to keep healthy food away from people to keep them in their place. Um, it's because it's not paying in the market. So there must be some sort of cost involved. This cost can either fall on the shop or it can fall on the state, plausibly. You know, either the state can subsidise apples in, sh in shops or the shopkeeper has made a condition of their business that they do this. If it's, if it's a cost on the shopkeeper, um, then either they no longer can afford it, in which case they might go out of business so there's now nothing there, um, or alternatively, they're going to have to pass it on in some way or they take some kind of financial hit. A question if the, one, if the shopkeeper's the one taking the financial hit is, why should they be the ones to do this? Why transfer from them, who typically won't be doing terribly well, to, other, to, to, to these people who supposedly benefit? If the cost falls on the state, um, you know, the state's going to pay for these things. Well, I mean, I don't really have a problem with that, but you can always ask something like this, which is, could you use the money for something else that would be better, like by giving it to people? And then they can choose whether to buy apples or not. And if the reason they haven't been buying apples is because they can't afford it, and now they've got the money, they can start buying apples if they like it, and someone will sell those apples to them. Otherwise, because that's just the way markets work. Um, alternatively, they might just spend the money on something else, in which case I think that's, that's probably okay. If you've got a rejoinder there, Kevin. Uh, Quickly, yes. Yes, yeah, we'll come back. Yeah, but if you, if you think about it, in my example, um, I've uh, I've pointed out that there are three apples, and that run out, uh, and the shop runs out of apples by nine thirty in the morning, which means that people are actually waking up at nine to buy the apples, which is something that we actually do. Uh, I've done that several times. Um, so it means that there isn't necessarily a problem that people aren't buying it. Maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, um, there is a, tradi a, a, a tradition of, you know, a lack of culture in that sense of sensi sensibility for, you know, making a cert certain, you know, sort of order or, or, or whatever. And there's also the point, okay, maybe you give people money to buy the apples. But if the apples are not there, they're going to spend the money on, you know, more bacon uh, just because it's unreasonable that you have to take a car and do 10 miles to buy a couple of apples. Um, also, the, I mean, this is the same kind of argument that then you can have if we just keep the attention on money and, and you say, okay, 
give people more money so that they can buy the apples or healthier food. But where does that money come from? Well, it comes from taxes. So, of course, you have to, to, to tax those who have more in order to give money to those who have less so that they can buy the apples. That's, again, a restriction on the alternatives of other people. Of course, it's, you know, in this case, it's, uh, you know, restrictions, you know, of, of the, the freedom of Jeff Bazin to have his car number 100, which is a very feel-good restriction, but a restriction nonetheless. So we, we still need that sort of an ethical basis that works for everyone in, in order to justify the choice. Okay, um, so let me give a quick reply then. One is I'm not a libertarian. So I don't object to, to taxing the rich to give to the poor. Um, uh, but not because I think it's good for the rich though, I should say. Um, I just don't object to it. And you know, that's for reasons of distributive justice and so forth, which are not what we've been really on the whole talking about. To go back just to the compulsory Apple proposal, um, uh, I mean, although I might suggest, you know, if, if, it's your, if you're the one who's the victim here, you might just go to the shop guy and say, I promise to buy apples, can you get four in? Um, is, yeah. Um, hey, maybe it's the, <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, so either there's a market failure or there isn't. If there's no market failure here, then demand will create its own supply. If really people really want to buy apples and they just haven't got the money and you give them money, now say, we want apples. Somebody's going to, in the end, come and sell them to them. Maybe there's some failure in the markets here, some failure of competition, something like that. I think, personally, this is unlikely for food shops. Food strikes me as a pretty competitive market in this country. Um, but nonetheless, maybe it's there, in which case, sometimes regulations can improve markets that are otherwise not working very well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, at this point, I'll, I'll just uh, interject with the chair's prerogative uh, and, and ask my own question. Um, I'll take you back to basics. My, my, my worry is here, Martin, that you've, um, in trying to address concerns about the nanny state, you've made it too hard for public health to exist. Um, that you've effectively removed a moderately objective measure that is a good, not the good, as you pointed out, not the ultimate good, but a good, and it's a clear good, which is health. Um, but your arguments for overriding that seem to be much more, well, they replace health with much more nebulous concepts, such as preference um, or value or um, uh, um, uh, personal interests. Because you argue that uh, someone might override the, um, the joy of health because they have some other set of values and other interests that take them over that threshold. But these are nebulous concepts, and the difficulty is they're going to be quite subjective, they're going to be scattered throughout the population, they're going to be different perhaps on very, very individual levels. So have we got any sort of non-arbitrary threshold for working with them? What kind of preference is a suitable sort of preference that would override this more objective measure of health. Because the danger is, if you've not got that sort of non-arbitrary standard, you're not going to be able to engage in any sort of public health activity other than the very radical ones, the, 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 the sort of the, the death or extreme illness um, problems. Now, is that the sort of state you want? Maybe that's what you want for public health. Maybe you want to reduce it to just that sort of extreme prevention of, um, of, of the worst outcomes. Um, but I am concerned that you've, you, you, you've missed, missed the opportunity to talk about the, the quality of the reasons that someone would give to override the necessity of public health. Have you got anything to say about that? I'll just get the, just get the book out. Um, <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity to go through chapters 3 to 15. Um, uh, and thank you all for remaining. Um, so, so um, I mean, one way to take your thought is, so there's health, which, which um, is for some reason not nebulous. You didn't defend that claim. But for some reason, health is not nebulous. And then there's these other things which are, fo you know, these nebulous, foggy things like well-being. And for the purpose of this, you kind of agree that you can be but worse off in health uh, but, uh, and yet better off overall in well-being. So if the idea is, well, we should just go with health, what that amounts to saying is that it's better to be precisely wrong than vaguely right. Um, 
So that's one thought. Another thought, though, is to try to make this slightly less nebulous, is that the kind of thing I envisage is um, that if you want to make a case for restricting people's auctions and so forth, is to find something within their own attitudes to their own behaviour. So this makes it a bit less nebulous. Um, this is, there's certainly no suggestion here that any public health measure has to be benefit every single person it affects in order to be justifiable. A measure might benefit lots of people, but be at the expense of some, and that might be justifiable. Um, uh, there's almost no policy that's going to be good for everybody and bad for nobody, and that includes the absence of a policy will not be good for everybody and bad for nobody. So there's complicated questions about distribution. So my suggestion would be to go to see if you can find evidence within people's own attitudes to their own behaviour that means you can say an awful lot of the people who are doing this unhealthy behaviour themselves think they're making some kind of a mistake. So, for instance, 70 to 90% of smokers say they wish they'd never started. That's kind of, you know, social survey evidence. You can add this to other sorts of things to build up a picture of people who really aren't doing something that they themselves think is a good idea. And that allies to the perfectly normal sense we're all familiar with, which is we can indeed be tempted to act against our own best interests as we see them, because we all know what we're like. Um, if you can't find anything like that, though, if you can't find any evidence, or any evidence that only a very small minority of people that this public health measure are going to affect really wish they weren't doing it, and most people are perfectly happy with it, then you think, well, why would you, why would you stop them doing it if you're trying to make them better off? So that seems a bit less nebulous to me than one might have thought. You might have thought, in fact, you might have thought. <laughs> I was thinking that, yes. No, that's brilliant. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Right. Um, well, um, time is against us, um, and um, uh, unless there's someone with a very quick question, um, I think we can draw this to an end. So um, our sincere thanks uh, to um, our marvellous speaker, uh, Professor Martin Wilkinson. Uh, if you'd give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, I should say that Martin's uh, uh, um, uh, appearance here is, is, of course, thanks to uh, uh, everyone that's, that's helped with, with the running of these events, and uh, it would be uh, remiss not, not to thank everyone. Um, of course, um, our, our very own Professor Tim Lusting, who's the director of ILAS, who's, uh, who's um, uh, created the, these events, um, and the, the team for Kiel Conferencing, um, conferencing and events, sorry, I should say. Um, um, the AVS team that have uh, sat through uh, all of this at the back, recording it uh, so marvellously. Um, and Steve Kilner, who has uh, done much of the uh, rushing around as well uh, in ILAS. Uh, thank you to all of you. And of course, to everyone in, in the audience uh, for the uh, support and contributions to the lectures and the great questions you've asked. And that includes uh, people online that have uh, taken the trouble as well to uh, post various questions. Now, already did it. You did it? Oh, have you, oh yeah, you have. You've, you've yeah. jumped the gun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, or, um, so, this actually concludes the series and the Global Challenges Lecture for this year. But, as you can see on the screen that Martin has so uh, uh, thoughtfully uh, placed there for everyone uh, uh, to peruse, um, there is um, an exciting eyeless program in place for the next uh, academic year for 23-24. Um, and um, uh, we're delighted to say that next year's program will be launched with a lecture by uh, Henry Dimbleby, um, who is a, a champion of sustainability in the restaurant business and the author um, of the National Food Strategy for, for DEFRA. Um, that'll be another hybrid event, um, and it'll take place on Wednesday the 4th of October, but it'll be at an earlier time. It'll be at uh, 1 p.m. in uh, the Keel Ballroom. But you, because it's a hybrid event, you can join in on, um, on Teams as well. Um, for full details of this programme and so much more, and how to register, of course, for these, um, then these are on the ILAS website. Um, but um, also, before we go, there's still just time um, to have a, a mention of another event that ILAS are supporting. Um, and this is the um, Ironbridge Innovation and Imagination uh, Industrial Memory as Global Challenge event. Um, now, this is actually a, a Keele Institute for Social Inclusion um, and a, a Keele Deal project. 
uh, in collaboration with the Ironbridge Gorge Museum Trust. Uh, and that's being led by our own professor, David Amagoni, who heads up the Keele Institute for, for Social Inclusion. Um, it'll be delivered by a panel of experts from Keele and Ironbridge, um, but it's, it's an online-only event. Um, so again, details of how to register for that will be on the ILAS website, um, but uh, I think that's a, a, going to be a remarkable, a remarkably interesting uh, um, talk uh, on uh, a very important, uh, of course, local uh, or reasonably local um, monument. So, with that in place, with next year all set up, um, I wish you all a very good summer, and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs>